any thoughts, feelings, fantasies, reactions you left here? It's fine if you didn't. It's good to just clear your mind, but in case. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it please. Reminded me of that case. Um, mom is having difficulty with the three sons that she has. Uh, she's so originally from Cambodia. She's um, in her 50s right now. Um, three sons that were born here, all adult children in their 20s, um, they have not left the house and they're not doing anything. So mom is really frustrated at the fact that they're bumming around. But every time she's trying to speak with them, there's this constant conflict. She, they're not really being motivated enough to go out um, to really looking for jobs and things like that. So she's super frustrated and there's nothing she can do. She's super depressed, husband's blind and she's taking care of them. She's on SSI, very low on resources. So she's constantly battle and she doesn't really speak English fluently, but her <laughs> sons do. So there's that, you know, language barrier as well. So she's fighting. And you're working with her. I'm working with her. Power to you. It reminds me of the, the t-shirt I saw, and it's going to sound tangential, but then we'll get there. So these two fine scientists in front of a blackboard, and there's this big formula going on here, and then it says, and then the miracle happens, and then there's more formula. <laughs> it's a miracle. When, we, when we'll start role playing, we'll do some role playing of parenting to child stuff and whatnot, maybe we can role play that as to what kinds of things she can or what might be of some use in helping these kids take loving, responsible, respectful care of themselves. Because presumptuous as it may be from so far away, it would seem that they're not doing that. But we're gonna, we'll talk a bunch and then we'll come back to that. It might even be next time, because it's a whole vocabulary that I think is particularly useful in helping parents talk to kids around, including adult kids, including to each other, and to ourselves around these ways. Great question. Okay, so the, any other? No, okay. So. The soul, spirit, essence, whatever you want to call this illusion that we harbor about ourselves. Speaks through feelings, one way. It certainly speaks through imagery and the metaphoric mind. And a big chunk of this class is devoted to just that. So I'm not going to cover that right now. And particularly we're going to get to Jung. We're going to talk a whole host about how the spirit, psyche, whatever you want to call this, speaks through imageries the metaphoric, the magic mind, and really play therapy. As you'll see, one of the ways that we, one of the essential ways we create self, the self is a narrative. We are the storytelling people. We tell stories about ourselves and each other. And play, in part, is the way the child tells the story of who they are. And in telling that story, they help create who they are. But I'm way ahead of myself. But anyway, we will talk about imagery and all that, but not right now, because basically most of the class. So one of the other ways that the soul, spirit, essence speaks is through the body. And I am not a body therapist. If you ever come across Greer Essex, she sometimes teaches here. She gives experiential workshops. She and I work together running groups at Southwood with these substance abusing teenagers. She is gifted, she is marvelous, she is wonderful. She knows the body. She is a body image, all that stuff, therapist. She's wonderful, she has dance things, and she's just wonderful. So, so the body. So let me tell you at least a couple of things. Did you know that? You probably do know this. All infants across all cultures, across all of history, so it's transcultural, transhysterical, transpersonal. Express the main feelings, of course, the exact same way. Even if they're blind and have never seen it modeled. Never seen it modeled. When you chew, you go, <laughs> you giggle. <laughs> when you're married, it's the same. The body speaks humanese. You speak through your body, humanese. As I told you, the body responds before the other areas of the brain. It's very, very primal. So, as you might well know, if you Botox your face, <laughs> yes, yeah, lovely. You're way too young, all of you, for that, but nonetheless. And we hook you up to your amygdala. Your amygdala is muted in terms of perceiving anxiety, fear, anger, and positive feelings. You're muting your ability to be as sensitive to feeling states. 
Because of course, the feedback network between the body, face, subtle muscles and all that and how we perceive and experience is one. Again, it's an orchestra, it's all these parts and you suddenly take the cello section, all that section out, you're not going to have the same big symphony playing the same tune. Movie actresses know that, it's a real bind for them. I think it was Meryl Streep, somebody was asked, you know, both, I said, are you kidding? How am I going to express all these feelings? Like, I <laughs> stiff face. Well, the other is you take a power pose, <laughs> delete, there's another image to delete. Take a power pose and you will make more bold decisions. When you, as you well know, when you go do your oral presentation, you're gonna, and you're gonna stand tall and you're gonna say, hey, I have some things to say. Oh, this is simple. If you say your name loud and strong, quiet, like a prayer. It's such a different sensation. Totally different. So it's just doing something like this or getting on there. Just totally different feeling. It's just the body. The words are exactly the same. Did you know that? If you wear grapefruit scent all shape curve reality. I mean, there's always variances on each end. But in general, more often than not, people would judge you to be five years younger. Did you know that? You wear scents that are floral. Average people will see you as being four pounds lighter. And, yeah, I was going to go out by four. And if they like the particular scent, they will see you as on average. 12 pounds lighter. Yeah, just on scent. Actually, let me read you this on scent, because this, I, I, this is too kind of complex, whatever, to, to memorize in a way. So females prefer t-shirt odors from men. For, uh, but not the brothers. <laughs> but not their brothers. Well, wait, but, so actually that's an interesting one too. It might relate to the same thing. That are less closely related to them and who have more diverse, this is why it was hard to remember this, MHC profiles. Okay, so MHC is major histocompatibility complex. Okay, a cluster of genes that encode proteins that provide information about the ability of the immune system to combat pathogens. The more diverse, the broader the range of immunological protection. So it's better to choose a partner that has a different. MHC than oneself. So here they're just the nose, preferring what ends up being natural selectively smarter. And as you might imagine, happy couples have in general more diverse MHC similarities than those who aren't. Yes? Um, but I, what I found interesting, I learned in my psychopharm class about that the women who are in birth control is with the ability to actually smell or have those oh. connections. Oh, there you go. Perfect. And so, because I did a study where women who were and then could smell and find the right ones, and the other ones there was no correlation when they were in birth control. So we're messing with nature. We're messing with the body system of guiding us following the soul or spirit. Exactly. Um, oh, you know the research that the feeling, the, the neural brain state of feeling like you have a broken heart is identical to actually having a wound in your heart. Oh, I don't know if you didn't know that. Yeah, it is identical. You don't, you don't differentiate from a neurobiological level physical pain and emotional pain. It codes the same. It, you have a broken heart. It is unbelievably powerful. I just read an article the other day that, I mean, we kind of already know this, but there's a scientific study that showed that um, doctors and mm -hmm. physicians actually um, felt, you know, it, neurologically it showed that they felt the pain of, of oh. their, their mm -hmm. patients. So, yeah. Actually, it reminds me of one I just saw yesterday where, oh, I know, there's an article. This is really interesting. There's an article, it's a little tangent, but that's all right. 
uh, in time on drones. And the pilots, if you want to call it that, they're not, obviously drones are unmanned or womaned planes. Now we're going to have to say both since the women get to be in combat. You can't just say unmanned, unpeopled planes. <laughs> but enormous stress in the bunker, because they're just saying they're flying these things in the bunker. But they, it was really interestingly read or a written article. It talked about it's like our spirit. They didn't use that word. Is in that plane. It really extends our sense of selfness, and they're unbelievably stressed just going through battle vis-a-vis -vis these planes. Vicarious. Vicarious, exactly. It hits the body. To add to that, it's just like how um, counselors often get symptoms of PTSD based on the trauma mm -hmm. that they hear. Right. Kind of right. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, again, it's empathy, mirror neurons. Well, yeah, it's a bunch of stuff in there. Um, what else do I want to say about the body? Oh, here's one. So heavy backpack, and you will judge the mountain to be steeper. You're thirsty, you will judge the water ball to be closer. I mean, it just impacts your whole perception of stuff. I notice, actually, a lot of times I'll have the feeling that my keys aren't in my pocket. And I realize it's first this feeling, and then I go, what's that feeling? Oh, my keys are in my pocket. Again, body speaking first. Um, oh, this I love. So if you think of, this is research, right? So you're told to think of an unethical event, okay? So you're thinking of some unethical event. You then leave, and you get a choice of a variety of little participation gifts. And two, one of them is a pencil, the other is, I think, a pad of paper or something, and the other is an antiseptic wipe. 75% <laughs> of the folks who thought of an unethical thing picked the antiseptic wipe. They, want to, they feel dirty. The ones who are told to think of a ethical thing, about half, exactly half, about 37.5, picked the antiseptic wipe one. This one's interesting. If you're told to roll, I love this. You're told to role play, but you're told to, to tell a lie, a pretend lie, on a voicemail, okay, and leave that. You then rate, <laughs> so weird, you then rate a bunch of different products and how desirable they are. You tend to rate mouthwash as highly desirable. And what? Mouthwash. Oh. On the other hand, if you're told to email, a lie, you will tend, again, it's all the same list of products, you will take, again, sanitizers, hand wipes, as more desirable. The body speaks human needs. The body speaks your soul, spirit, essence, whatever. Love that one. Um, you know about the vagus nerve that connects your colon to the rest of the brain. It's amazing how much we talk about gut reaction, we talk about somatization. It's one unit, and it talks to itself back and forth. The heart math people, you know, again, heartmath.com, Gewurz is real big into that. Really fascinating research, heart math. It gets a little brandish and a little marketing sales ish, but it's, it's got this little gizmo and looks at your heart rhythm and trains you to have very even rhythm, coherence. It's not just about lowering your blood pressure. And the way to do it, and this I love, is attitude of gratitude. You're not just imagining you're at the Bahamas kicking back. That'll lower your heart rate and whatever. It won't make it more even. My first time, you move it from red to blue to green, the whole thing. The way I got it to green was imagining the first time, pushing Duran into his first wave. It's late summer, beach club, horse shores, it's warm. Son, Daddy pushed me into this wave. I pushed him into the wave, and he turned around before he dropped. His face lit up with this evening, the afternoon sun. Even now, I think of that. I bet if you put me on, I go to green. Attitude of gratitude. Body space. But they're very, very conscious and aware of heart as a messenger signaling system with the brain. Very cool stuff. You know about Einstein's brain, speaking of brains. You know about Einstein's brain? You know they have Einstein's brain. They pickled it. 
Okay, so it's genius. They kind of go, we want this brain, we've got to figure out. Well, it became a whole, there's a book, about, I think it's called Einstein's Brain. Right? Because it was in um, Princeton, I think. Well, somebody took it. Yeah, they like, just stunned it with Einstein's brain. They carried it around with them and whatnot. Anyway, they studied the physiology. The only thing that was different was his parietal lobe was 15%, significantly bigger than about anybody else's brain. And the parietal lobe is more involved with sensation and kinesthetics and feeling and sensing things. He very much sensed things, felt things, imagined things, when we get to Jung with imagery, before he formulated them in that prefrontal cortex. Logical. Einstein. Oh. Yeah, that dude, Albert, Atlee. No, I just I don't know that. That'd be fascinating research. When we get to when we talk more about mirror neurons, we'll talk about autistic kids and that. But that'd be really interesting too, the whole kinesthetic part of it. But that it was interesting about Einstein. Um, is there any other little quickie you want you to know about? No, I think that covers that part of it. So you gotta pay attention to your body. Your body will tell you. You listen to your body, it will tell you. Okay. Which way do you want to go now? I'm gonna give you a formula as another way to look at parenting. <laughs> Okay, so we get hurt in life, pumpkins. We get wounded. And in some ways, it's a function of the following variables. I'm going to obviously explain these things. Okay, again, could be wrong, but it's one way to look at things. How wounded you are in part is due to your sensitivity quotient. IQ is important, SQ is more important. I would dare say, well, probably everybody in this room has a very high sensitivity quotient. By that I mean, again, you're obviously, you're, you're amygdalated. You have a very sensitive amygdala in other aspects of your brain, so that you have all felt feelings profoundly, pronouncedly, and fully, and you can't help yourself. You know, these early infant, you know, like three hours or whatever. And some kids, you just touch the little feet, and they're like, wow, And others, you kind of go, hm, hm, and they're like, huh? <laughs> it is not related necessarily at all to intelligence. I'll tell you the story of my three dogs. It's not necessarily related to intelligence. By the way, there's also cultural differences in the sensitivity quotient with, with kind of matching more stoic cultures that more so, but nonetheless. So very sensitive to feelings in general. And by the way, the worst thing you can say, well, let me add one other thing, and then I'll tell you the worst thing to say though. And they're very sensitive to the appraisals of others, how others are praising them, you. So the worst thing you can say to somebody sensitive is, stop being so sensitive! Which is what you hear most of your life. God, would you stop being so dang sensitive? I can't help it, I have a megalitis. I can't help it. I think there's also a propensity for the shirikura kind of woulda. You feel bad. Really concerned about how others see you, and you think, God, if I only did this, I should have done that, then I could have done that, then it would be this. And they loop. Should have, could have, would have, should have, could have, would have. Stop! That level of cognitive behavioral, stop! I actually have a stop sign. <laughs> and, I, and I text it to my clients so they can, you know, see. Yeah. No, though, you, I, I've thought of a lot of different apps that would be useful in this regard. Yeah. But it's not, and I have them think of some negative shoulda, coulda, woulda, and then I go, stop! Went away? What happened? Let it go away. Oh well. Anyway, you get the idea. 
But, but, by the way, as you know, that's not the end of the story. And I know mindfulness says don't do the stop, let them think. I, I know, I understand. But then the story is stop thought, then op thought. You have to replace it with something positive anyway. Or you watch it as a leaf, or you spin the thought. There's a lot we can do with it. Any event, so highly sensitive to feelings, highly sensitive to the evaluations of others, others, and kind of shoulda, coulda, woulda. By the way, the flip side of guilt is control. We feel responsible. That's why we feel guilty. Therefore, we have this illusion of, I have the power. Therefore, if I did it differently, it wouldn't have happened. Therefore, I have control of the event that I feel guilty about. Even though more often not, I have no control whatsoever. But the horror of having no control is much more terrifying than the burden of feeling guilty. Am I making sense? Because I think it's really important. We, you're going to deal with a lot of, never mind kids, but adults who feel very guilty. And oftentimes, I mean, sometimes we did do something that we rightfully should feel guilty about. But a lot of times it's an illusion of control. Let's see if I can find very quickly <laughs> this. Can you see this? You see my poochies? Notice the, the uh, license plate, four, three canines. Let's <laughs> <laughs> look at the see, yep, poochies. So, oh yes. So the middle one, Seraphos, that's the mom, bred her with a beautiful golden retriever and kept two out of the 12 pups that were born on my kitchen floor, one after the other, after the other, after the other, after, oh my God. 12 of them and we kept pancake I know, Hokey name. The girlfriend at the time had a dream about this golden, golden retriever named Pancake. We were going to call him Flapjack, but he was black, so we called him Blackjack. So Pancake, Blackjack, and Seraphos was the Greek island I lived on. Okay. I saw the dad on a motor scooter. I thought, what a beautiful dog. I then saw him in a bank line. Oop, intact. Did a tryst. There's the products. Why am I bringing this up? Because of sensitivity quotient and how it's not related to intelligence. The most sensitive of those three dogs is Seraphos. Very sensitive dog. You have to treat her with a lot of gentleness. Because if you don't, one of two things will happen. If you yell at her, Seraphos, drop the ball right now! She would either do one of two things. Either immediately pee, or bite you. Kind of fight flight. Make the lightest. Boom, right there. Bam. Okay, okay. In fact, I had to go through a whole thing with her as to who's the dominant. You just take them early morning running on the beach, late at night running on the beach, and that G, blah, 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 blah. She didn't want to leave. So she would not leave and grab and Tom Rusk worked with policemen who worked with police dogs. From the day they get the dog from Germany, police dogs, I don't know if they still are, but these dogs come from Germany. You have to speak to them in German, sehr gut. As soon as the dog did anything you didn't want him to do, you roll him immediately on the back and choke him. Not hard, just, I know, it sounds so mean. Me on the back, boom, who's boss? There I am at the parking lot of Scripps, right there, and Seraphos doesn't want to leave and she's doing that. Thank you, Tom Rusk. I put her on her back. I really did say, I understand you don't want to leave. <laughs> I really, I just swear to God I did say that. You had a transcript. I really get how much fun you're having here. I understand it doesn't feel fair to you <laughs> that I get to have the power and the say as to when we go. I'm really sorry. She's kind of looking up at me. I'm really, but she gets the tone, she gets the face. I really mean it. I get it. I totally get why she doesn't want to go. A part of me doesn't want to go, but I got to get to work. I got to get to work, otherwise we won't have dog food, okay? <laughs> got to earn the money and I love what I do, okay? I promise that we will come back tomorrow and I'll come a little earlier so you can, oh, this is part, but I really did say all that. Okay, empathy, limits, window in the door, when you get to come back, some kind of partial gratification. It's really important, partial gratification if you can. And got up, got into the car, we left. About two months later, she did it one more time on the ground, that was it. That was it. Let me write something about stolic and partial gratification. 
Starlet bike. Okay, so very sensitive. Black uh, pancake in the middle. They love, they love chasing balls at Wednesday at night when nobody's around. And in fact, I didn't realize I was actually shaping their mouths to hold tennis balls. Because what happens is the ball, tennis ball, gets wet and has sand, just like sandpaper. Ha ha ha! So I had perfect ball carrying mouths. Uh, come on, give me the ball. Come on, come on, give me the ball. Go. Oh, okay, I'll give you the ball. Blackjack, smartest of the three. Love you all. They taught me that you can love more than one thing at a time. So love them all. Pink, uh, Blackjack had two gifts. One, actually three. One, he could find a tennis ball within 300 yards if there's one in existence. If he was here and there's the tennis ball within 300 yards, he would find it. Two, he had even a greater gift for finding catch it. He could find catch it within 1,000 yards. And I am in this little Carmen Ghia, the three dogs, as before I had the Jeep. Oh my God. He had perfect um, object permanence. If we had a tennis ball here and we put it somewhere and he leaves six months later, he'd go right to there to find the ball. But he was the least sensitive. He was the smartest in that sense. The least sensitive. But you give me the ball. I know you really want the ball. Give me the ball. All right. Back, give me the fucking ball. All right, I gotta go. Ah. Okay, you put it that way. I'm not telling you to yell at your kids. I don't think it's useful at all. <laughs> We'll get into the issue of yelling or disciplining and punishment. Punishment is power over spirit in service of pain. Doesn't work, but we'll get into that. Okay, so the higher your SQ, obviously the more vulnerable you are to feeling wounded in the world. Because everything hurts you. Just the subtlest look. Yeah, please. I'm so sorry. What is the last thing that you just said? Say it again. Pun I will. But I will going to be saying it again anyhow. And, and again, I'm being really over fast and a little bit dramatic. But in a sense, punishment is power over spirit in service of pain. Well, it's really trying to change behavior. But it's doing it through a method of pain. But we'll, we will look at all that and analyze that, and we'll discuss that. And I could be wrong, and there's more to it than that. But it's a facile way to kind of go, wait a minute, think about what you're doing here. But we'll get to all that, obviously. Uh, I just said something, I don't remember what it was. That's okay. So, oh, so the higher the SQ, right. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So here it is. You're at the dinner table. You're a high SQ. -er. You're trying to get the peas on your fork, your little pumpkin. Never mind chopsticks, you can't even get the peas on the fork. And you happen to notice down the table that dad just has this little twitch in his eye. You're freaked. Oh my God, he hates me. Oh my God, I'm such a bad person. Oh my God, I should have cut the wood. What you didn't notice is that dad just had a little something in his eye. It had nothing to do with you. You immediately personalized it. Oh, that's the other thing highest gears do. They personalize everything. It's me, it must be me, it must be me. Your brother who's the lowest Q, like Blackjack, is, there's no polite way to eat spaghetti. He's like, he's trying to get the entire bowl in on one loop. That's like, God, come on, this isn't a barn, you know, all that kind of stuff. Doesn't impact him at all. Low SQ. Not going to be near as wounded in the world. There's a blessing and a liability in being a high SQ. It's great for being a therapist. It's great for being a parent. It's great for being all kinds of things. But it's lousy if you're going to eat sloppily at a dinner table with somebody who's going to be critical of you. You have a comment or a question. Do you, because I was thinking about, not to generalize, but yeah. men versus women. Ah, please generalize. I higher SQ yeah. than men. Correct. So do you think it's more of a nurture thing versus a... The problem with the nature of nurture, first of all, is always both. And, and that's really where epigenesis really comes into play. It's epigenesis. Let me give you a quick epigenesis. Epigenesis is the impact of nature on nurture. So here's a weird example. Water fleas, water fleas, mm -hmm. happen to be smooth coated surfaces, okay? If the mommy water flea is attacked but not devoured, survives the attack, her little offspring water fleas will have barbed backs 
that better protect him. But their genetic makeup is identical to the smoothback. So what happens is the environmental factor impacts which genes are in fact evoked. What we forget, and I didn't know frankly, is we have all kinds of genes and a lot of them stay dormant. And some get activated and then they get deactivated. So environment activates neurology and goes on and on and on and creates that. So never mind all the culturation stuff. But Erickson was right that at least in this society and probably most societies, because I think he did transcultural Eric Erickson research, boys do tend to build the tower stuff and girls do tend to do the circle stuff. That is true. There really are neurobiological differences in who we are. Pre, again, you have much more oxytocin. Oxytocin is an incredible hormone. You know about oxytocin, yes, if not Google. We have vasopressin. It was this kind of complementary. Oh, uh, there, there, now I'll protect you, honey. But it's more protective, hmm, kind of thing. We also have oxytocin. I'll give you a little hint. Nature is so smart. So smart. When men have an orgasm, it releases oxytocin. Nah, 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 nah. Come on, bond, buddy. You got some. You got lucky, okay? Now bond. <laughs> you know what it also does, which is just so wonderful? It releases nit nitric oxide. So you're more likely to laugh and giggle and be connected. I forgot what animal it was. was Volving. Where the, the male takes care of the, the children. <laughs> Well, I know that they use the, I think it's called vo, 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 v -O -L -E, something like that. There's, there's a rodent that they use because they mate and stay forever together. Yes, and they have much higher level. Well, you, you shoot oxytocin, actually snort it, frankly, to, and I'm sure there's some people you think, here, have a hit, man, you could use it. <laughs> bond, baby, bond, to um, autistic spectrum kids, and they will engage and bond more. Oh, absolutely. And if you deplete oxytocin, even from the volpe, they become less loyal and devoted and all that. Oh, yeah. Nature's very severe. Anyway, did I answer your question? Oh, good. Okay. I realized you asked a wonderful question. I kind of went, but yeah, it has a lot to do with it. Okay, so E is simple. Environmental, negative environmental factors, obviously. But I'm looking at a big, broad spectrum here. I mean, there's the big stuff like alcoholic parents, like being molested and abused, horrific traumas. Of course those impacted, duh, how wounded you are. And imagine how much that's amplified if you're really sensitive. Never mind, you start to dissociate and do all kinds of things to block yourself because you can't handle that much negative stimulus. But I'm also talking about little things like, and this can sound so silly, pre-email, pre-texting, pre-Facebook, I didn't get the word that blue tennies were no longer the in thing at La Jolla High when I was a senior. And it finally was kind of in the in crowd because I surfed well enough, okay? And I wore blue tennies that day. I looked around and all the cool people weren't wearing blue tennies anymore. They were wearing black tennies. I never wanted to get my shoes off so quickly. So of course the analysts would say, that's why I tend to love not wearing shoes ever since. <laughs> and since I'm my own boss, I have my own dress coat. And in my work, I don't wear shoes. I go Asian style, I don't know if that's Asian style, but, and our kids love it, and the parents are like, oh, that's okay, that's cool. If I do see Hispanic, where folk wear the expect me to wear the tie thing, I don't wear a tie, but I will wear my shoes. So I am culturally sensitive in some ways. But it was traumatic, I remember it obviously. I'm 64 years old, and I remember being 16, 17, whatever it was, and the feeling of shame. Oh, God, with that, because the blue tennis weren't in anymore. I'm talking about curly hair, you want straight hair. You had straight hair, you want curly hair. You're fat, you want thin. You're thin, you want fat. Whatever it is, there are enormous amounts of subtle and not subtle negative environmental cues. The girl I saw yesterday, just yesterday, hot off the press, here we go, a cutie pie who has an, who has an unbelievably high sensitivity quotient. And her mom, the wonderful lady who loves her, also has a very amygdalated being. She would be the first to say it. So this little pumpkin is sitting at the table at school. And this mean kid told all the other kids to point at her. Right, good response. 
your mirror neurons are intact. You just went, oh my God. We'll call him Bobby. So Bobby goes, hey, everybody, point at, we'll call her Janie. Point at Janie. Sorry. See, she's never going to sit here again. She's getting all this vibe. Thing. Clear the vibe. <laughs> Force fields. You're totally protected. You're fine. And then, Howie says, point all your fingers at her. Made it even worse. But one girl, Martha, didn't do it. So I looked at little pumpkin. What do we call our little pumpkin? I forget which name. Jane. Thank you. Good. Boy, there's your hippocampus. Excellent. Janie, you Jane. I said, oh my God. I'm a, oh my God. I act like you. So what did you end up doing? She said, nothing. I just went about, I just kept doing my work. I said, that's, in, you know what I would have done? I would have gone, because <laughs> part of me wanted, so wanted to cry, just go like, oh God, I'm so ashamed. Oh my God. But I was like, I'm not going to find them. No, I'm not. <laughs> I wouldn't like that. I wouldn't totally like that. Totally like that. It's unbelievable. You are, you are so strong and so courageous that you were able to sit, that will really serve you well in life. That's incredible. <laughs> that you were able to just sit there and just do your work. I, I would have just, my mom was like, oh my God, I would, have, I would have gotten out, I couldn't have been at the table, I would have gotten up and left the room. You betcha, you're a hero. That's really important because trauma isn't as much necessarily as the event, of course, but how we encode it. How it impacts how we feel about self, other, and the world. And I want her to understand and underscore the positive aspects of how she handled that so that that's what she can say to herself about that event. Yeah, they all did that, and I just went about doing my work. Yeah, bring it on. Spirit, spunk. That's really cool. So I, it, it's very intentional. By the way, if you haven't gotten it yet, one of the other things I think is incredibly useful, and we'll go on and on and on about this, not only in terms of parenting, but certainly in terms of therapy. You've got to be a tradeologist. Tradeologist. You've got to be aware of what positive trait that child is evincing in this moment that's useful when they're 30. And you're looking forward to saying, and that will serve you well in life. You're a tradeologist. You're just looking for it. In fact, I always say to parents, underscore the trait underneath the behavior you hate. You might hate that they're being such brats, and uh, but they're spunky. They know what they want, and they're not shy about letting you know. Nobody's going to push them around in life. That's fantastic. Tell them that. First, then first empathize, then go for the trait, then go for the, and that having been said. Okay, so very clear about negative environmental impacts. And again, it can be subtle, it can be profound. Now. P.S. Parent stuff. You're all grad students, you're all sophisticated lexiconists. You can handle the term parent stuff. <laughs> we all have stuff. Parents have stuff. Parents put onto their kids a lot of their stuff. Now, I'm going to go into a spiel about something that I think is one of the most uh, important and dominant aspects of human functioning. It's called Shifting. And I want that. Again, never mind you're going to learn a pancake recipe. A few things you're going to care from this class. I hope one of them is a really, really reflexive understanding of what shifting is. Shifting is the following Shifting is creating, creating in others our own inner states. Different than projecting. Right? Projecting is, to varying degrees of accuracy, perceiving in another our own inner state. I know you're mad just a minute when you're not mad at all. I'm misperceiving you to varying degrees. You eventually get mad because I keep telling you you're mad, and now you become mad. So that's projection, misperceiving, putting my state onto you. Shifting is very different. It is creating in others our own inner states through our actions. Passive aggressive behavior. Classic shifting. You're not mad. You're waiting for your friend to come for lunch. It's now the fourth time that they're 22.3 minutes late. Now you're mad. They're not now. 
They've now kind of created in you their anger. Oh, here's a great one. Here's a classic shift. I was working with an, a woman, pop star actually kind of woman, musician person, all that, very talented actually, borderline, cutting, all that stuff and whatnot, ended up in a hospital, suicidal, etc., all kinds of stuff. She moved. Scene one. You know, la 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 Sound asleep. 2.58 in the morning. I don't know. 2.59 in the morning. Ring, ring, ring. Yep, it's called a landline. Some of you don't even know what that is, but it's this phone that's attached to the wall. It has this thing. Actually, it had, no, it did have the punch buttons. Uh, hello, 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 hello. Hi, this is the operator calling from Sam Crumetto, calling from Sacramento. And we have, what's the good pop star name? Britney Spears. Well, not exactly Britney, but she can't. we have Britney, we'll call it Britney. We have Britney on the line. Uh, and she'd like to talk to you. We'll accept the charges. Remember I told you I have a problem with names? Not issues. Names. Brittany, Brittany, Brittany. Yeah, sure. Sure. I'll say, Hi, Dr. Brittany. It's Brittany. Uh, uh, uh. Wow, wow. Okay. Um, wow, you sound really, really distressed. Yeah, I've, I've just taken a bunch of pills. I'm going to die. And I want yours to be the last voice I ever heard. Because you helped me so much. Oh, my God. Brittany, I know exactly who you are. I don't say that last part of it, but now I'm totally present. Oh, my God. Uh, Brit Bye, Clink. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I know exactly who she is. Uh, uh, uh. Let's see. On TV, you can trace the call. Oh, but it has to be at least three minutes, I think. That wasn't three minutes. I called the operator. Can we trace this call? No. Oh, my God. You know, Volcani. 3.31 a.m. <laughs> you know, I'm Balkani. 4.58 a.m. You know, I'm Balkani. Dragging himself out of bed at 6.30 a.m. So let's list the feeling states. You know, I'm Balkani at 2.58. Fasting, quiet, peaceful, home on the range. We're happy campers. <laughs> 3.03 a.m., 3.00 a.m. You know, I'm feeling what? Hmm, let's see, scared. Holy shit. Kind of helpless, not kind of, very helpless. Oh my God, I can't impact it, I can't do anything. A little bit of hopeless, like shit, man, I worked with her, we did inner parenting stuff, we did, we even had this little baby that represented her inner child, and had her take care of it, and ah, oh, shit, man, it didn't work, obviously, because here she is, I don't know if she's dead or not, but she's maybe, oh my God, oh my God. So, and then a little bit of angry, a little bit like, fuck, man, why'd you dump this on me? And then guilty, oh God, I shouldn't feel that. I'm a loving clinician, and she can't help it. And this is before I knew about amygdala and all that. But that's a huge array of feelings. Guess who else is having exactly every one of those feelings? Brittany! Scared. Helpless. Hopeless. By the way, you know that's the definition of depression versus sadness. Helpless, hopeless defines depression, as opposed to just being sad. So scared, helpless, hopeless. Angry, for everything. She just injected, she just virulated like a virus, boom, into me, her inner world. Great example of shifting. Let me give you another, just a silly little example of shifting. So on my birthday, I treat myself. I go surf Rincon. Rincon is a world class wave at Santa Barbara, on the county line between Ventura and Santa Barbara. It's a beautiful point wave, okay? I got treat myself. And this time it was over Martin Luther King, so I got three days in there. Got in there Sunday, surfed in the evening. You give me one Rincon wave. One. By the way, surfing is riding piggyback on the universe, being cradled in the arms of God. It is unbelievable. We'll talk a lot about surfing. You know I have a wave on my wedding ring. This is the wave I told you I drew when I was done. I mean, anyway. So, so if I get one wave, one wave, wave, I can drive all the way home a happy man. 
Well, I was averaging two waves per session. Two beautiful, I mean, Rincon's very crowded and all this other stuff. And prof incredible professional surfers surf it, and so it becomes a spectator sport and stuff. My last wave, I'm crouched, I'm zipping along, I am so happy. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And suddenly I feel something tugging at me and pulls me out of the wave. And then it turns out there was somebody right behind me. It's such a perfect wave, it could be two people. You want to have one person, but you two. And I said, whoa, dude, all I had to do is tell me you were there. I would have kicked out. It's like, perfect shift, right? Here I am, happy as a clam. Here he is, feeling pissed off, like, damn it, you're ruining my wave. Get off this wave, fucking blah, blah, blah. In his action of, he didn't have to hold. In his action of pulling me, what do I end up feeling? Fuck you. I feel mad. I feel like you ruined my wave and all that other stuff. Perfect shift. Here's an even a simpler one. You getting this? Because I really want you to get this. You got a stoplight. You're listening to cool jazz or whatever. You're having a great time. And you kind of listen, and you don't notice that the stop, the green, right? It's now green. You didn't notice it changed to green. Bam! Person behind you honks at you. Now what do you feel? First you're afraid. Whoa! And then you're mad. God damn it. Mm. And they drive past you. Mm. <laughs> what were they feeling? They're at the stoplight. They're fine, whatever. They see a change. For a moment, though they might not be aware of it, they feel scared. They're not in charge of what's going to happen next. Brain's about prediction, right? The prediction is you now move. That's just fucking that up. You're not moving. Nicola fires. Fight, flight. Now it's in the fight. Honk! Boom. You just caught their whole thing. They just shifted to it. Well, imagine in intimate human relationships how much shifting occurs. Let me do a quick role play on that one. This is happening, I swear to God, right now, this very moment, in therapist offices across the land. This very thing is happening right now. The wife, the female partner of the quarter, full of that wonderful oxytocin and whatnot. The husband, the therapist. This is happening right this second, throughout the world. So what brings you here? I love him. Come closer. Honey. Okay, fine, don't. Fine, don't. I love it. I feel so alone in this relationship. I know he loves me. I, love me. I know you love me. You don't have to tell me, talk to him. I, I can do this. I know you love me. But I feel so alone. I feel so unheard. I feel so unseen. Oh, tears start happening. He's like, Therapist is like trying to kind of empathize with both. Half his face is like, it's okay. The other's like, oh God, you must really be hurt. And I do that. I try to connect. I try to, to do things together and whatnot. He, I mean, he's with the football thing, he's with the golf thing. He seems to like he cares about, I'm like the last on his list. I mean, you get this, you hear this, you've heard this, you know this, you've felt this. Therapist, let me guess, she's the one who suggests the therapy. <laughs> He's thinking, waste of money, waste of time. <sighs> I don't even know where to begin, okay? Look, I would do anything for you. You want the shirt off the back? You got the shirt off the back. All right, yeah, so I relax a little bit with football. I'm with friends, I said to God, I work my ass off nine days to get the things you want for your. What I want, no, I don't want. Oh, all of a sudden, if you're lucky. Otherwise, I'll just be quiet. But if he really starts to talk, he's so mad. And he feels what more, as he wouldn't know this, but as Freud once said, you know the famous Freud line besides the cigar one? You know his other famous line? Do you know this? What do women want? Freud couldn't figure it out. What do women want? Sorry to be genderistic, but that is a true quote from him. What do they want? What do they want? I don't know. What more do you want? Now, if we look at the concept of shifting, Right? We're imagining that what she feels is what he feels. But he's not saying it. He's not experiencing it that way. Now, it might be in this relationship, but it might also be in some past relationship. Ah, so now you systems people and your dynamic type people who might say to him, you know, it's interesting. What I'm hearing you say is you feel lonely, unseen, unheard, wanting to connect with you. 
you know, I'm a psychologist. I get to ask weird, crazy questions and I always make more of things than they really are. Tell us, now, notice how I phrase this. Tell us some time in your life when you, when you felt like that. Now, don't, notice I didn't say, have you ever felt like that? Because he might go, no. Words, how you use the words are really important. It's called creating realities. I create the reality, already the assumption that he has experienced this. So I'm not asking whether he has, I'm asking him when, in what context. The very last class, when you look at the videotape of the group therapy with the teenagers, you'll see, I'll point it out when I do create realities. And I don't ask whether, I say, when this happened, how was it? Tell us a time when this happened. Well, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a big deal, but, um, well, I, I used to, um, you know, my dad would work really late. And uh, so, so he wouldn't be there for dinner usually. But I, I, I remember whenever I'd uh, uh, hear the uh, ca car come, uh, you know, he'd, he'd come driving in, uh, and then he'd come uh, into the house. Um, and and uh, he wouldn't even, like, say hi to me. And I was so excited. and like, Daddy, Daddy. And uh, he would just go right to this, I remember this chair, and it was big, and it was red. And he would just sit there, and he would just read the paper. And he didn't even look at me. And I, He's not crying. She gets up, oh honey, oh honey. Now this is the man I married. Oh. <laughs> Sensitive. Okay, do you get this? Are you getting this? Okay. Parents shift on the kids, all kinds of states, of course. Thank you, happy couple. I'm glad you now got much better. You understand her pain, and now you can take care of each other very well. Good job, therapists. So one of the things, of course, they shift is the wounded child. The wounded child. I mean, the classic cliche is, right, most parents who abuse their kids were abused as kids. Duh. I will create in you the exact states that I felt when I was your age. So whatever the kid is feeling, scared, angry, scared of being angry, all that stuff is what the parent felt when they were that age. No brainer. Well, uh, we'll call it the perfect child. You be the perfect one that I wish I would have been because then my parent would have loved me. Stage moms, I guess, is the cliche on that one. Rebellious child. You say fuck you to me the way I wish I could have said fuck you to my parents. Again, overstating all this, but you're going to see a beautiful tape. You're going to love this tape when we get to foil therapy. That's a rebellious child. Beautiful, beautiful. And you know, the, the policeman or judge who has a delinquent kid, the, the uh, minister who has a prostitute daughter, whatever. I mean, they, they get the kid to play out that aspect of them that was the rebellious one. You get the parentalized child, like in alcohol systems. You take care of me the way I wish I would have had my parents take care of me. Okay? These are at least four basic positions, and you can combine all this, that parents put onto their kids. Which, of course, increases the sense of being wounded. It's, a, it's really a subset of a negative environmental event, obviously. And if you're highly sensitive, and you've got this going on, you're going to feel very wounded. Thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions, because I'm noticing it's, oh my God, 1110. Okay. Wounded child, WC, not water closet. <laughs> well, I might feel like that. You might feel like shit, sorry. Did you say what the F stood for? F where? This F? I so little, it's a function of. I so rarely remember my math, but I remember there's like an F to mean a function of. And I think it's in the parentheses, isn't it? Yeah, okay, I got it right, huh? Oh, four out. High school geometry came into play. Was the wounded child the one that the father came in and speak to him? No, parents abused their children because they were abused. Yeah, wounded child is exactly that. Just imagine a, a psycho transcript of the soul, or the spirit, of what they would say. Just, do, just start noticing it in your own life, in your own relationship. Is it 
you're feeling mad or whatever, is it because they're feeling mad in your context to you and they've shifted it? And or is it that this is something from your past that you're, it's shifted onto you? By the way, there's all kinds of, we'll get into all kinds of positive shiftings. We'll get into parenting. I mean, there's all, there's, I'm looking at the dark side of shifting. Shifting is the dark side of resonance. It's a type of resonance. It's really important. And of course, the fancy word for this is projective identification. For you, yes, very good. For you analytic types. Because it really came in the literature by Kernberg, Kohut, these people who worked with borderlines, narcissists. The other people that shift brilliantly, by the way, teenagers. You work around teenagers, and one moment you're like, excuse me, just give me my PhD. I, I don't know what I need to do anymore. I am so good with this kid. She tells me, I've never been able to tell anybody this. I've never felt so close to anybody. I'm so glad you're in my life. I've had a lot of therapists. They were all, you're fantastic. And you're like, huh? Huh? Can we record this and I can show it to my supervisor, but everybody? Because I just give my PhD. As a matter of fact, just give my license. I just leap over this thing. And guess what happens the next time? They don't show up for their session. In fact, they fired you. They don't want to see you anymore. You suck. And besides, your, so your socks are weird. <laughs> they're brilliant. Oh my God, they're so brilliant at shifting. Oh my God. I'll give you an example. I know, but let me go over two more minutes, three more minutes, because I want to give two. I'm good with teens. I am, man. I'm duck feathers. I'm going to talk about psycho Aikido and how to manage teens. Well, there's one little obstreperous 13 year old was in my group first day. In my group first day. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. She absolutely mocked and mimicked every single word I said. She absolutely mocked and mimicked every Oh my God, oh my God. Ha! Ah! Ah! It was incredible, it was brilliant. I finally stood up and said that. You're incredible? Oh, now, now you get a good one, I think. You're shielded. You know what, I'll do it on somebody else. You're incredible, you're brilliant. I gotta tell you, I teach a class and how to deal with spunky adolescents like you. <laughs> right now in this group, unfortunately, you win. You, you're, you're better at doing what you're doing than I am at doing what I'm doing. But I've got to ask you to leave. I'm so sorry. Because I've got to run this group. And I can't do it the way this is happening here. But you win. Let me be very clear. It's my problem, not yours. Okay? You win, but you got to leave. But I can't wait for you to come back. We're going to find a way, because you're fantastic. The amazing thing is, the amazing thing is, she did not mock me while I was saying that, which amazed me. She just kind of sat there, and she got up and left. It's amazing that she did it. I didn't know what to do. I sat I, 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 I give up. You're right. You win. White flag. You win. I came back the next day. This was, a, this was when I was working in South. I said, I, I saw her privately. I said, look. I've been thinking about you. But by the way, it's a big deal then to think that really you think about them. It's not just the job. You're not just doing you know, rent a friend. You're just doing. No, I actually thought about you while I was surfing in between waves. I thought about you a bunch. I've been thinking about basically ever since. It's amazing. I realized what I felt. I felt hopeless. I felt sh kind of ashamed. Like, oh God, I'm supposed to be three. Uh, it just was a whole bunch of different feelings and kind of alone, like really not in control. And I realized you must feel those things in all kinds of ways that I'm not aware of. And I'm sorry that I'm not sensitive to you about that. I want, you, you have such wonderful power. I want you to be part of this group. And I want you to help co-lead it in a way, using that. Because you're real sensitive to feelings. Right now you're really good at getting others to feel it. But maybe you can help others see it. She became a great member of that group. Let me give you one other shift before we leave. So I'm running this inpatient hospital. You know. I'm just coming on board, okay? I'm opening the door. And I see this kid, and he's got that altered state look in his eyes. <laughs> the only thing between me and the door and freedom is you, Volcani. Mm -hmm. I was taking karate at the time, because I could see this kid was going to punch me out. So I was thinking, 
<laughs> wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off. He comes up, the staff's behind. Get out of my fucking way, I'm gonna punch you. Before I could even say anything, I was gonna do a little empathy and a little, bam! He hits the fire alarm thing. As I am, as gracefully as possible, falling to my knees, <laughs> I remember thinking, interesting, the fire alarm's not going off. Janitors should see that about that. <laughs> that was my thoughts. I'm going down thinking, that's really weird. It didn't go off. I look at him and I say, I'll never forget it, very quietly. I know this is going to sound really bizarre, but I'm wondering, what are you scared about? Because I am scared shitless right now, and I wasn't a second ago. What I didn't say to him is, what are you so mad about? Don't start that. You're just lighting the plastique. I hate this place. This place sucks. You suck. That's not of any use. If we use shifting, one of my experience would have great fear. I'm assuming he just shifted that onto me. He is experiencing great fear. So let's talk about the fear. But you've got to own that that sounds really bizarre. When somebody's playing, it seems really weird to say, what are you afraid of? But you own it, that you're scared right now. And what he said, interesting enough, was, I think my grandma's going to go on path, die this weekend, and I don't get my pass. And it sucks. And he turned around and went back to his room. By the way, I'm obviously telling the stories that work. There are plenty of times where this works, OK? I'm like, oh my god, he's such a god. He knows that. No, I'm telling you the good stuff. <laughs> You gotta filter through. Here's the good stuff. Because I want you to learn from the good stuff. God knows I'll tell you my mistakes. I already told you, I promise you, I'll tell you the one with a parent. Oh my God, I've made mistakes. Above all else, do no harm. I don't know what I've done. Other than that one, I might have done harm, but I didn't intend to. She was a borderline anyway, it wasn't my fault. Okay. <laughs> borderline, narcissists, teenagers, shift like crazy. Okay? Go be aware of shifting in the world, your own and others. Thank you. I see you next week. I look forward.